Then we're about to get started with the next uh, point on our agenda, uh, which is uh, the second crisis panel. And we'll now move to uh, the biodiversity loss uh, crisis panel. Uh, and for that, I welcome uh, SSNC Secretary General Karin Lexian, who will be facilitating uh, this panel. And we'll do as we did the last time. You ask all your questions to the audience using Slido and use your thumb to mark which one you're most interested in. Thank you. Thank Welcome, you. Karin. It sounds a bit uh, terrifying with the second crisis panel, but make, let's make a try anyway. So we all know that healthy ecosystems are crucial and that they are in a drastic decline all over the world. And as you also know, according to the latest IPES report, more than one million plant animal species are at risk of extinction, many within decades, due to habitat loss, climate change and other human activities. The loss of biodiversity, as we all know, threatens ecosystem services that are critical for human well-being, including food security, clean water and climate regulation. So, we all know there is a need for transformative change in the way we use land, produce food, manage ecosystems, to ensure that biodiversity is conserved and restored, and that the goals of the Paris Agreement on climate change are met. Since 2019, and the commitment to the EU Green Deal, there is a more holistic approach towards climate and environmental issues in the Union. One priority in the Green Deal is to protect and restore the environment and oceans. And this priority includes protecting the EU biodiversity ecosystems, reducing air, water and soil pollution, moving towards a circular economy, improving waste management and ensuring the sustainability of EU's blue economy. The EU biodiversity strategy for 2030, the EU forest strategy and the farm to fork strategy lay the foundation to restore and protect nature and improve the quality of EU forest and land. These strategies were then followed by the nature restoration legislation, which is currently negotiated in the EU institutions this year. The aim is to make sure that EU member states take necessary actions to protect and restore nature. In addition, the EU has also huge influence over marine and agricultural biodiversity through the common agriculture policy and a common fisheries policy. And these two policies are extremely important to promote sustainable management methods for agriculture and fisheries. CAP and CFP will be negotiated over the next years, and there is an opportunity for the EU and its institution to look over these policies so that they are in line with international and European commitments for biodiversity. The EU also supports the UN coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework that was agreed upon last December. This agreement aims to address the ongoing biodiversity crisis described in the IPES report. The agreement includes targets for the protection and restoration of ecosystems, including forests, wetlands and oceans, and addresses the drivers of biodiversity loss such as climate change, habitat destruction, and overexploitation. But one may ask, is EU really walking the talk? And is the Green Deal really the right recipe to the crisis? To discuss this, I'd like to welcome up the panel for this session. And they are Matte Blindberg. Please come forward who is the chairman of, in Swedish, Svenska Samernas Riksförbund, the Swedish Sami Association, and also Randy Heder. The second panelist is uh, Charles Berko, who is a 
policy analyst at the Stockholm University Baltic Sea Center. And thirdly, but not the least, uh, Sergi Moros, policy manager for water and biodiversity at the EEB. So when talking to you over the phone uh, the last week, we said that this is not a very easy uh, scope because there's so many different dimensions, but let's try to capture a little bit of it. So the overall question, and maybe Sergi, you want to start to respond to that is, to what extent has the European Green Deal delivered an appropriate EU policy and legislative response to the crisis? and what is yet to be achieved, and what are the main challenges? Thank you, Karen, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be in Stockholm and really talking about um, our other crises, but I think we also shouldn't be splitting these crises against each other. We really, we cannot prioritize one over the other. In the end, when we are talking about the biodiversity loss, it is about our own survival, the same as uh, with the climate, the same as with the pollution uh, crisis. And a lot of the solutions to those are the same. And that's where, that was one of the added value of the European Green Deal that tried to advance us on the road to climate neutrality, to more stable climate, as we were discussing at the previous uh, uh, panel. It also introduced elements to deal with pollution and with uh, nature loss, with biodiversity loss, because we need to halt that loss and uh, recover. And I said, it's really our survival is um, at stake. So the comprehensive approach of the European Green Deal is uh, uh, very, very welcome. Um, of course, the, usually the way the Green Deal sets a framework, then it was followed up, as Karen explained, by a number of strategies, and out of those strategies come um, um, either legislative or non-legislative um, actions. And that's sort of where we are at the moment. Um, um, and again, as we were discussing before, there were several, um, uh, 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 several moments where it looked like the EU was about to give up on its um, ambition uh, to protect and restore nature. When COVID uh, struck, there were all these voices that now is not the time than the horrible uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, there are all these voices saying, again, we can't really uh, do this anymore because it's undermining our food security, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there, are, uh, there was always a pushback against it, but some of it did stay on track. So the European Green Deal in terms of nature did deliver. We do have a global agreement that Karen uh, referred to. You know, we've all heard about the Paris Agreement. Well, we have something similar for biodiversity agreed last year where more than 200 governments, including EU, playing a key role, including Sweden, uh, being a part of that. We do have an agreement where the world has come together and wants to stop the decline of biodiversity and start recovering it by 2030. And I know we were chatting yesterday when Charles said, but haven't we had this goal already? And yes, it's Let's true. talk about that <laughs> soon, I'm sure. And it's true, we <laughs> did have it already, but we, you know, we, we also now have uh, the sort of, you know, community coming together. And there is still more uh, that needs to be done. We need to be solving climate and biodiversity crisis together. So, you know, there is, there is still work to be done. But it's, A, it's good that we have an agreement it's good that we have some ambitious pieces of legislation coming out. For example, deforestation regulation that has been adopted. It's one of the pieces of the European Green Deal. And it really is trying to uh, make sure that the uh, products that are placed on the EU market uh, do, not have a, uh, uh, do not have embedded deforestation. I, uh, you, and um, you want me to finish, right? Yes. Uh, so, no, we have, <laughs> Correct. So we have some pieces of legislation that 
have already been adopted, now really need to be implemented. We have some pieces of legislation that are currently being discussed, and again, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, we really see a huge opportunity in the nature restoration law, if it is designed, adopted well, rolled out well, can real be a game changer. But there are still pieces of legislation that are still to come. Uh, for example, we are expecting the Commission to come up with a soil health law. You will have to talk more about well. that later on. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but, but, but I'm really happy to have this positive start because you're really telling us the glass is half full, right? Charles, now it's your turn to really be positive, but you, you already before you talked to me also about the lack of implementation and you also said like, well, in Gothenburg, the first Swedish presidency, we already then talked about the integration on the environment and we didn't get that far. So what is your stake? Is the glass half full or half empty? Well, it should be full. It's <laughs> <laughs> another way <laughs> to put it. Um, it. It really needs to be full. Uh, just a, a couple of words first about what I do. Uh, I'm at the Baltic Sea Center at Stockholm University, which is focusing on the Baltic Sea environment. And my task there is as a policy analyst. So we're, we're, the center is trying to bridge the gap between science and policy. In order to do that, we're trying to analyze how does policy work. And I think that fisheries policy, which is where I focus on, is a really, really good topic to study because we make annual decisions and we get annual scientific advice and we can see what was the result of the last decision? What was the how closely was the advice followed? How is the advice formulated? So one problem that we have is that um, the um, already back in, well, you've already stole some of my things about, <laughs> I was going to say, it's really good to be talking about biodiversity here in Sweden during the Swedish presidency, because back in 2001, during the first Swedish presidency, is when we said that we're going to stop the halt, halt the, the loss, of the loss of biodiversity by 2010. Uh, yeah. And we repeated it again, I think in 2020, with the 2020, uh, sorry, in 2010 with the 2020 biodiversity okay. strategy. And now we're repeating again. And I guess we're at the stage where it's progress that we keep on repeating the goals and at least haven't dropped them. And maybe e even add new goals like, like reversing uh, the loss of biodiversity, which is very nice. 2002, uh, during the sixth environmental action program that we adopted, said that we're going to integrate uh, biodiversity into fisheries policy uh, in the 2002 fisheries reform. In the 2013 fisheries reform, it's explicitly mentioned that the, the, the fishing should uh, reduce the impact of fishing on the marine environment and in particular contribute to achievement of the objectives of the 2008 Marine Strategy Framework Directive to give us good environmental status in all marine areas by 2020, which by the way that you promised the UN in 2017 we would achieve by 2020. Uh, so to the Green Deal, has it delivered? Well, of course it's too early to say. Uh, it has delivered a, a number of policy initiatives, which are very nice, and I'll, I'll just run through them. Uh, kind of quickly about fisheries. Uh, there was a, 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 an action plan on fisheries and biodiversity. It's really good that they've done such a thing. When you look at it, it's appealing a lot to the member states. Please do what you promised to do before. Uh, it's really good that there's an energy uh, transition policy uh, adopted, uh, but it, it doesn't really say anything about reducing the need for energy in fisheries by increasing fish stocks. Mm. And it really also doesn't say anything about carbon pricing. So we spoke about it a little bit during the break here. Uh, fisheries has been exempted from the climate package, basically, yeah. now. Uh, it's not included in the revision of the, the emissions trading directive. Uh, it is included in a very weak way in the energy tax directive, which is so weak that it wasn't even mentioned in the previous panel. Should I go on? One you last can, thing. You can have one last thing now. Yeah, we one can last thing you later on. Yeah. A, that I think is really positive, and I'm not sure how much credit you can give to the, 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 the Green Deal about it, but let's say it's, it's, it's connected to that. And that's the uh, uh, amendment to the Aarhus Directive, which gives environmental movements the possibility to challenge decisions made on the EU level. So already there's a group who's taken the, the, I, the EU to court on fisheries and said, wait a second, you're not following the existing legislation. Mm -hmm. This is really important. 
yeah. potentially. And needs to be tracked and followed up because we are a little bit at risk of, of that kind of, of, of possibilities, I think. So we really need to follow that. But Mati, turning to you, uh, we went to, we were in Brussels together some months ago and uh, from your perspective, I mean, the, by, by words, the, the EU says that it should protect the indigenous people's right and it should be integrated in the law and biodiversity, etc. But what is your perspective on all this? Well, very shortly, what happens in Brussels stays in Brussels. I don't see so much action in my... We live in a quite remote place of Europe and... I haven't seen much action that help us, the Sami people, and especially the people that try to live out of radio herding. It's a traditional way of life. And um, on the opposite, almost, uh, more regulation and uh, make it more difficult for us to, to handle the rangers in the natural way, you know. We produce meat, of course. There are slaughters buying the reindeers. We have to transport them 100, maybe 150 kilometers to a slaughter. Instead, in the old days, they come up to us and move with mobile slaughter. So they could own place. So it's a lot of that kind of things. But when I was young, many, many years ago, in the 80s, my old uncles told me, we was out in the reindeer corral separating reindeers before, before the winter. He says to me, Something happens in the nature now because the reindeer doesn't behave as it used to do. And the snow is different and the weather is changing. That was before the climate change was a known word around the world. But the people up in the Arctic noticed it for all the... Because we live in the nature, we see it in nature, we read the nature and understand something's going on here. And this depending on human activities. So I really in a way, I put a big hope into the European Union because um, I think the Swedish government, whatever the government looks like, have, not, have done nothing right for the Sami culture and for the, for, for the reindeer herding districts because we want the Swedish big state-owned, government-owned companies, LKB, the big mining company, Svea Skog, the big foresting industry, Vattenfall, you heard about them? Government owned? All of those three companies have started up in Satmi. They have made the fortune up there. Mm. And it's still, they still operate in my area. And that, that, that kind of historical happening under 100 years create a, a kind of structural races. It's difficult to understand it if you don't they really are live in that reality. I notice it every day. I don't feel sorry for myself. I survive. But I feel sorry for the reindeers that die of starvation, or the mooses that die of starvation, or foxes that find fine food. I feel sorry for the whole functionality on the landscape. So the biodiversity is soon gone. So I'm not that optimistic, I'm sorry to say. But a small, small light in the horizon. Because I noticed that the forest policy makes an impact on the Swedish forest industry that don't make them the most happiest company in Sweden in those days. So you put a little bit of hope to the EU and anyway, but because I, I think you're really in the spotlight, I mean, really being affected by climate change, at the same time also being at risk for the green transition, not taking enough of, of um, caution when it comes to the Sami rights or the biodiversity in your part of... Uh, there's a lot of discussions going on yeah. in Norrbotten about this. To make it, the green transition right, or is there a green transition? I take the word, no, because this green transition makes me black of anger. Because for me it's not green. For the green transition, it's, it's presented to me by the companies acting in northern Sweden, it means more mining, more infrastructure, more electric producing, wind power, hydropower, that have a direct impact on my life. You have all, all the infrastructure around it, and they're talking about 100,000 more work created in the northern Sweden. That means at least two, 300,000 more people live there. They want to use the nature as a playground, so that's what it is. Today in Kiruna, it's a small question, but for me it's a big skiing, helicopter skiing is a big issue. We have about 20 helicopters going up and down the mountainside in spring. 
when the reindeers want to get peace for calving, but we can't do anything about it. So more human activity have a big impact in my small society. But we, of course, we are a small group of people in the northern part of Europe. So I really hope that the European Union can help me out to reach the Swedish government, put pressure on the national government to take better concern about indigenous people. So I want to address the union and the member states, put pressure on the states in the European Union to, to ratify the ELU Convention 169 by indigenous people, right? That is, that is not a solution, but it's a little step in the right direction. And that's make my voice stronger, because I think the Western industrial society need to learn more from indigenous people of thinking in circular terms. Mm. See what I mean? My English ain't that we, good, we, but, no, but you're right. We're talking about circular economy. Yeah. But it seems like to be a lot of words, and I think the Sami people really are in a circular way of thinking. So. I think so. I think all the indigenous people, because they always live up the overskotted, we say. Surplus. Surplus. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No. So, Sergei, now we are turning into another direction here, but, but I also wanted to, to listen to your views on how would you be able to then take on the, the latest uh, biodiversity framework, listening to Charles yeah. saying that, well, we, just, we heard it all before, but maybe there's more talk about implementation now. That's yeah. what I hear, at least. So. No, I think you're absolutely right. So just maybe very quickly to uh, Matty, the, the, the whole debate around indigenous people's rights, the knowledge in how it should be done in protected areas was, you know, is a definitely a very, very big topic, was a very big topic as part of the Kunming Montreal. So I'm not saying it's been resolved, but at least the understanding of that and recognition of that is very, very strong. And if we look at the biodiversity strategy, one of the targets there is to strictly protect some of our remaining area, which is also where uh, you know, your community uh, lives, and it needs to be done in harmony with the subsistence needs and traditional way of life of Sami communities. So you know, there we, we need to protect uh, last remaining old growth and primary forests, but we also need to do them in harmony with the local uh, communities. Uh, so yes, so the reason, uh, but then of course a lot depends on how it is implemented and done uh, by the government. Also uh, bringing a little bit what we discussed at the previous panel, uh, whether it is about uh, green transition, huge uptake of renewables that needs to happen, uh, critical materials that we need to, yeah. uh, for. for uh, there are really, really important safeguards that need to be maintained, uh, whether they are in terms of environmental legislation, uh, uh, protection of particular species, etc., or whether they are uh, in, in regards to access to justice that Charles brought up. We do see really, really important provisions either stemming from the Aarhus or giving communities or NGOs to bring some of these plans and challenge them in court. So, for ex you know, so that's something that really needs uh, to continue. And to give you an example of a Swedish presidency at the moment as part of the negotiations on the nature restoration law, Swedish presidency is proposing to delete an article on access to justice uh, or move it to the recital. Um, and, and that seems to be getting a... So, you know, Did you hear that? You should... Uh, Tweet on this, I think. We, we, we did. We did write a letter, yeah. so you know there is a there is a letter asking for this. But it just sort of to say yes, it's true. There are huge opportunities there, but it really also then comes the way it is applied, the way it is implemented. And yes, yeah. to answer your question, Karen, implement, and that will be something that is so important for the second phase of the European Green Deal. Yeah. We definitely need European Green Deal too. We need to continue yeah. Yeah. on this path. There are still pieces of legislation that need to fit the puzzle, but the big focus for the European Green Deal too also needs to be about implementation. And when it comes to implementation, it's primarily about political will. Because if there is political will, there will be money, because very often that's one of the big barriers, lack of financing. If there is political will, there will be money, there will be coherence between different policies, there will be uh, participation of stakeholders on board, etc. 
So it really comes to political will and big, big focus on implementation and using the things and powers that we have. You know, the European Commission is the guardian of the treaty. They, we, we, we hear a plea from Matti. We hope that the EU will make sure that the Swedish government applies those. That means the European Commission, as the guardian of the treaty, really needs to make sure that the legislation that is being adopted in Brussels is properly resourced and applied across all the Union. That's true. And that's why also the upcoming EU election is so Absolutely. fundamentally important. And so, so I just before turning to Charles, and maybe you can respond to your own questions. Why is it that it is like it is? But uh, before that, uh, I mean, with the nature restoration law, it seems like it's a little bit of pushback, not it only from the Swedish presidency. And, and the, the feeling I got when I was in Brussels is that it's also a little bit of pushback yeah. awaiting the election some hoping that there might be another kind of majority next time. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So no, that is a little bit terrifying, I think. It, it is ter it's terrifying, and you know, this is also a bit of a plea to all of you in the audience to really have a debate around nature restoration in your countries, in your families, really uh, you know, using some of the tools that we put out there to tell your decision makers, go on the EB website, go on the Restore Nature website, tell your e EU decision makers, uh, this, uh, your decision makers in the council, in the parliament, how important nature restoration is. It is that positive agenda that helps us solve biodiversity and climate crisis together. It will help us with adaptation uh, to climate crisis by uh, reducing pollution, by looking at uh, water resilience, at uh, dealing with those extreme, that healthy nature provides all those extremely important benefits. And we know voluntary approach to this failed, so we now have a legislation being discussed that sets legally binding targets, both for uh, protected nature and also wider landscape. And Karen, you're absolutely right. Those interests that uh, are resisting change, that don't, wa that don't want to change business as usual, that don't see that big transformational systemic change, how we're managing land and water and produce food or grow forests, they are all up in arms pushing against it uh, and um, um, with the view either to completely scrape it or with the view of uh, delaying it until the next elections. And in a way, even though you know the EPP, so the European Conservative Party that just this week voted a resolution at their Congress uh, saying that now is the time to stop uh, EU Green Deal agenda and particularly mention nature restoration law and particularly mention sustainable use of pesticides regulation that is trying to reduce uh, the amount of pesticides that we use while growing our food. And in a way, that and they're saying they are doing this because they are defending the interests of the farmers. They are the farmers' party running out to the next elections. They are defending interests of the farmers who already have to do too much, and we are undermining food security with this. Uh, and, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, with the <laughs> Polish farmers protesting the Ukrainian grain, that is not the continent that is running out of food. And we also have the huge amount of science that, or the, the progressive farmers that are already doing it. We don't have food security. Security. And it might, you security. might ask, whose, whose farmers are you protecting? Indeed. The current or the coming, or who? So, thank you. And I, I'd like to turn to Charles as well. I mean, there's so many questions out there. <laughs> I, I know it would be difficult, but also looking forward with fisheries policy. And also, I mean, you have been before this panel and during this panel been talking about the implementation. And what is the sort of answer to this? What, what should we do in order to get the glass a little bit fuller? Yeah, right. Well, wh one thing is, is to realize that implementation is so important because uh, I have a feeling that both in the environmental movement, environmental politics, in the media, tends to put too much focus on the next new big decision and tends to forget the last big decision. And that's why we are where we are. So that I think that um, if we would all put a little bit more of our energy into following up implementation, realizing that implementation is a long haul, because a lot of times in environmental decision making, we, um, uh, we make a decision with a long implementation period. 
in 10 years we will have done that. Mm. And so it's a challenge for us and we have to be aware of this, more aware of it in my opinion. How do we keep on course? How do we keep the politicians on course? Uh, how do we keep the, the, the policy on course? Um, and if you think in, in, in terms of an endurance race, to pace ourselves and to keep ourselves on course, but also sometimes it's a relay race. We have to realize that there'll be turnover and personnel and things like that. And then we have to be more structural about how do we work out the, the exchanges of the baton in the relay race work so that we don't lose tempo, we don't lose focus when we change people. These kind of things I think are really important and we, by becoming more aware of them, then we can be better at following up. Another important point about follow-up is the national level. And connecting, it was mentioned here before, the importance of connecting the EU level to the national level. National awareness of what the EU tools in the toolbox are, so we don't forget them, and so that we actually use them. And that's why it's so, that's why I'm happy to be here talking to the EEB, because I think that you have like a, 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 such an important role there with a lot of competence in Brussels, but also active member organizations around in the member states. And we really, really need to make those connections work over the long run. The trick is one, one more question. We hear now again the myth of that Sweden is over-implementing the EU it's, law. Oh, God, no. <laughs> you heard that? And yeah, and this is why it's really good. Let me see. It's, there's a, a, a section in the Bible. Uh, um, I'm going back to my roots now, uh, <coughs> having grown up in the, in, in the belt loop of the Bible belt in the United States. <laughs> but um, uh, if I may be permitted to, sure. to, to refer to, to the Bible as a... Uh, uh, where where uh, Jesus goes back to his hometown and he starts to preach and they say, wait a second, we know this guy, why should we listen to him? And he says, ah, you can't be a prophet in your own hometown. That's why you also need people from the outside to come and give us a look. Mm. and see, see the, 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 the beam uh, in our eye that we don't see ourselves when we're just focusing on, on, on the piece of grain in his eye. I think that was a fair enough uh, quote, so thank you for that. Yep. But uh, I, I'd like to mention, if I can, one other thing that I think yeah. is really important, and that's um, uh, is a, is a, a, a biodiversity is, is, is trickier than climate. Tricky as climate is, uh, you have like measurable targets there much more measurable than you do for biodiversity. You have uh, 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 instruments that are also much more measurable. You have things like the, the, the Energy Tax Directive. We don't have an extractive biomass tax directive. Why not? More tricky. Huh? It's more tricky, it's a lot more tricky, except that, like, say, for fisheries, we know that we're extracting thousands, tens of thousands of tons of biomass. Mm. Mm. In Iceland, they tax it. In the EU, we don't. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, we give the subsidies to the fishing industry in the form of exemptions from carbon pricing. Um, but so for biodiversity, is a lot more tricky. And a, a, a hinder that we have is, is uh, 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 requirements for scientific certainty before we move. So we have to know how far we have to move and how fast. And, and it's not enough for the policy to know we have to move in that direction. We have to move a lot faster than we have. So I'd like to refer to a, an article about that that's like identifying scientific, unreasonable demands on scientific certainty as a barrier, a fundamental barrier to environmental policy that was co-authored by one of the people in the room here, by the way. Uh, okay, <laughs> let's go back to that. Mati, we, we talked about the green transition before. There is also another saying that is the just transition, and you were a little bit into that, but if you were thinking of the, the concept of uh, just transition, uh, what would be your message to maybe to Brussels but also to Stockholm components yeah. that we need to have in mind? As you saw, we, we met in Brussels a month ago, something like that, and there we also I met some people from Latin America, South America, so fighting for the forest, for rainforest, because there was, a, there was indigenous people, there were American mining company that would come in and take out, extract some minerals. I don't remember what, but anyway, they try to fight them because they need the forest for the animals and for the, the livestock. And what happens then, they get the animals killed, people shoot them, if they try to stop the, yeah, the destroying of the, 
the natural landscape and then they, because they need the land. And then I realized it's the same mechanism all over the world when it comes to, to, to big companies that want to make quick and fast and big money. Because exactly the same thing happens in my home area. If we protect, try to protect the forest from logging industry, we know a couple of days later we're going to find dead reindeers in the forest. Or if you see a picture on the social media when people run over reindeers with snowmobiles. So it's not only a problem in remote country from here, it happens in, in, yeah, in my area. And I become so emotional when I start talking about this. It's very hard for me to explain myself because it, it's a reality I live with. It sounds really unreal, but that's a fact. And it's not happens every day, but it happens. And once is once too much. So. so I think, I think it's very, I see it very dark in the future because I have met some of the new politicians in Sweden and ministers and I realized they have very little knowledge about indigenous people and very little knowledge about the Sami people and no knowledge at all about the reindeer herding culture and the ecosystem and the functionality of nature and biodiversity. So that is my message to you. Yeah. work in the European Union, help us to, to get them to understand we, the need to make indigenous people around the world equal with the rest of the population, because then we could sit around the table and have meaningful discussion about the future. But today, we become overrun by economical interest, because the economic interest had the, the law and acts on their side. So that's, that's my message. Yeah, that's Thank you. a very good way of putting it. And so, Sergi, uh, I think we have questions, but if you would like to take one minute on looking forward for, uh, I wanted you to say something around CAP, for instance. Uh. No, I think it, uh, Matt's point is absolutely right. You know, we need to look at the big, powerful economic interests, those vested interests that are, you know, really maintaining uh, those uh, huge sectoral policies, whether it's the CFP that Charles mentioned on the common agricultural policy. And in a way, the Green Deal tried to do that. Unfortunately, it came almost sort of too late uh, in the negotiations of the cap. But these are, you know, the, the big, big priorities for uh, EGD2. You're, uh, you're also absolutely right. It depends on the elections uh, results. It depends on what the uh, uh, next agenda for the EU really is. But those are the key drivers that we have to address the land use, the overfishing, the uh, overlogging, uh, really making sure that the policy is right. We're also using things like economic instruments in the right way. We've mentioned the polluter pays. That is totally not applied. We mentioned some of the precautionary approaches that are already there. So all those important elements really, really remain as a huge priority. Maybe one difference, and that's the science is very, very clear, we are running out of time. Yeah. Uh, the window of opportunity before we reach those tipping points is closing. So, you know, we probably won't be in a luxurious position in 2030 saying, you know, we will try to halt the loss of biodiversity again because there will, you know, we will, you know, we already see what climate change feels like with droughts everywhere. So, the toolbox has been there for a while and now we are really run out. Running, yeah, out really running out of time. So time. that, that is perhaps the conclusion. Anneli, I can see you're standing there and I'm sure you have a lot of different questions for us. The audience has several questions. Um, there's one concrete question on what should be the next European Commission's top three priorities to further halt biodiversity loss and restore biodiversity within the EU. So that's one. And then uh, there was a question raised also on the link between loss of biodiversity and agriculture and how it's not aligned at the moment, but you already commented on that. Um, there's also been uh, points raised on uh, the more the difficult situation with uh, worse uh, droughts and uh, what policy 
policies need to be put in place to ensure that we strengthen resilience uh, towards droughts in the future. Uh, and I can also mention that, uh, as Matti was already commenting a bit on, that you know there's agreement from the audience also that at the moment uh, it's like rain deer herding is sort of seen as only a human activity and not really as part of the ecosystem and like so there's um, yeah there's a need to integrate the indigenous use of land into biodiversity legislation so that's uh, not so a question that's it's more, more a of a it's more of a comment from the audience yeah. where a lot of people see that but maybe i think those uh, top three priorities and also how to strengthen resilience i think that's a question for all of you actually <laughs> uh, you want to start, Charles? Sure. Uh, three priorities. One is tighten the loopholes. Because if we're saying that like things are legislative and things like that and, and binding, uh, if you look at, say, fisheries, there's loopholes. So you have to tighten the loopholes, number one. Number two, rules of thumb are necessary to use instead of waiting for the scientific certainty. Uh, uh, and the th third thing is that the Commission should really take on its role as the guardian of the treaty instead of the maker of deals. Because it's been too much in fisheries policy and I assume in, in many other policies, it works as the maker of deals in, f in, in practice. Um, so, yeah. and if, uh, should I say something about the um, drought? Yeah, please, because I think this in is fisheries? the last round, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I don't know about drought in fisheries, but we have like a, a, a similar problem, and that's marine heat waves mm. that are like really, really potentially very damaging. And obviously, the best thing that we can do is to, to um, not extract as much biomass so that we have like more fish, and in particular, make sure that the biodiversity within the fish species is maintained. And again, rule of the thumb, don't extract as much biomass as what we're doing. Thank you so much. Very, very smart. Uh, Mati? I have no really good answer on any of that question I'm saying because it's so difficult issues yeah. to understand the complexity of. So is it anything else you'd like to um, send with us? Something I think like I said everything and most important I think maybe, compact and short answer is put pressure on the Swedish government to, to live up to the international standard for, Indian, for the indigenous people. In that way we help the planet to survive in the long run. Yeah, thank you. And maybe also visit not by helicopters, but maybe walking in, in your Absolutely, areas. if it's possible in a way, but at the moment the, the, the whole landscape is so fragmented, so we can't <laughs> we can't really work in an old, really traditional big way because the landscape is dis yeah. destroyed. Yeah. We have mines, we have railroad roads, and we have overflowed rivers, we have a hydropower station, the, bank, the ice is not secure, so we have to use technical help. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But we are trapped in the system, of, so. That's true. And Sergio, three top priorities and how to deal with drought. That's really yeah. your area of work, isn't it? I, I think, you know, we, we just need to, uh, first of all, we need uh, to have uh, nature, biodiversity, the uh, climate, nature, water as another really, really big political priority. So and it would not just only for the environmental side, it really needs to be a priority across the government. So one key, even though, you know, biodiversity is a bit of a sectoral policy, one key thing that we really need for the uh, next Green Deal, the whole of government approach to solving nature, biodiversity, pollution uh, crisis together. In terms of kind of three specific things for the biodiversity policy, we need our road with protecting nature that is still needed. We have a lot of the paper packs that are there just on paper. We need to manage them well. We need to connect them well. In some cases, we need to enlarge them. In some cases, we need to strictly protect them. So big piece of work on protection still needs to continue. We, uh, restoration is a big new positive.
collective agenda, the, you know, we need to make sure the nature restoration law, and coming back to Charles, um, nature restoration law is also learning a little bit in terms of monitoring, how do we need to do monitoring, how do we set these legally binding targets, for example, you know, we are setting them for ecosystems and member states need to put measures in place, not necessarily achieve the results, allow nature to recover, etc. So it already is a relatively new, innovative model for restoration that takes into account some of the things that you highlighted that maybe we haven't been doing so well. So restore nature is one big. And then, you know, as we were discussing to do, the big third priority is around the sustainable use, is about all those other sectoral policies, whether they are energy, whether they are food, where they are transport, uh, whether they are about hydropower or something else, you know, in some cases, um, you know, we need, uh, we don't, you know, there are, yeah, so really a big agenda around the policies, sectoral policies around the uh, sustainable use and the importance of coherence there. And uh, in terms of drought and uh, water policy, absolutely, drought is a very natural event. It is intensified by climate change. So again, a key message there, we need to work with nature, how we are managing um, our water. We need uh, to maintain the uh, hydrological cycle. We need to invest in natural water storage that will be helping us, whether it's uh, floods or whether it's droughts or, or whatever climate scenario is developing. So really working with nature for adaptation to climate change and uh, coming back to the point that we made before, really implementing the policies that we have. We have the Water Framework Directive that allows us to deal with droughts as a supplementary. We really need to implement and enforce it. And yes, there are some pieces that are missing, but that's also something that we think the EGD2 can do. For example, we can put in place the climate adaptation law that is additional to the current legislation that we have, but really helps us to drive the action in addition to mitigation piece that we've been talking about. Also, how we adapt to climate change yeah. with nature, really with uh, political priorities that it deserves. So thank you. We need to work with nature, not against nature. Maybe that could be the conclusion from this and we need to implement. So thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. I'm sure we could have kept on for quite a long time, but now our time is over. And thank you for listening. And by that, I'm... Thank you for a very interesting conversation. Uh, we have now come to the third and last one of these crisis panels. So now I, it's time for chemicals, chemicals policy. So I welcome Tatiana Santos, head of chemicals policy at the EEB, and your whole panel will you bring with you and will present. Thank you. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Welcome. To, to this discussion, to this panel discussion, perhaps on uh, one of the most uh, invisible, uh, underestimated, uh, yet uh, pressuring issue of all, ta all times, uh, which is chemical pollution. We have the pleasure to have a very high panel speakers with, with, with us today. But perhaps just to give a little bit of introduction on where we are and how we ended up here. Um, just think of uh, the production of chemical, uh, ke uh, chemicals has increased uh, 50-fold since the last 70 years. And uh, scientists are telling us that we have uh, surpassed uh, planetary boundaries um, and we have surpassed safe uh, limits of humanity. Um, not, we, we don't see chemicals, uh, we don't smell them or taste them, but they are everywhere. Uh, they, you can find chemicals everywhere you go, from the highest mountains to the deepest oceans. Uh, whatever you do, uh, from eating to shopping to breathing, uh, we are inviting more and more chemicals to the privacy of our homes and intimacy of our bodies. This means that all of you, um, all uh, living beings in the planet Earth, store toxic chemicals, uh, industrial chemicals that were made uh, for uh, making non-stick frying pans, uh, solvents, 
paints, uh, plasticizers, and even babies uh, are born today um, with this load of uh, industrial chemicals in their bodies. Um, we have also learned that we are not only highly exposed to chemicals, but also that we are uh, highly vulnerable. This exposure uh, causes a, a wide number of health uh, problems uh, from infertility, um, developmental disorders, cancer, just to name a few. And chemical pollution is not an isolated uh, crisis. Uh, it, it has, it's very closely interlinked with uh, climate change and biodiversity loss. We would like to discuss today with you what are these links, um, but uh, chemical pollution is one of the main drivers of biodiversity loss and also chemical industry is by far the largest energy cons cons uh, consumer um, and also one of the largest uh, emitters of greenhouse gases also contributed to, to climate change. So what has been done in Europe so far and uh, was still to be done, um, we have a, a very bold uh, vision uh, through the European Green Deal um, that really uh, brought us, uh, um, or gave us a roadmap towards zero pollution, toxic free environments, um, how to support the green transition of the chemical industry that is that so badly needed. Um, and uh, its chemical strategy for sustainability was also key, is at the forefront and the center of the, the European Green Deal as it brings uh, measures and actions that can support this transition that is needed and um, help to, to, to reach the future that, that we want. Um, there are some important revisions such as the CLP regulation, REACH regulation that unfortunately, as we heard today, um, has been delayed, uh, giving in to the calls of some uh, chemical uh, industries. We can also explore the impact of this uh, delay. But also, I would like to, to give a bit of overarching view on uh, it's not only about REACH and, and CLP, but there are many other uh, re revisions and legal initiatives that are very relevant to chemicals uh, pollution and can really address the problem. Um, and these are now uh, currently being discussed, negotiated, or are coming very soon, uh, such as um, the eco-design, food contact materials, industrial emission uh, directive, ambient air quality directives, urban wastewater uh, treatment directive, and also the use of sustainable uh, pesticides uh, regulation. So, taking into account that the forecast is that the production is uh, projected to tri triple again in the next 30 years, and that urgent national action is um, inevitable. Um, we cannot uh, go in another way. I would like to discuss with you how to properly tackle chemical pollution uh, to ensure um, the goals of the Green Deal from a clean circular economy um, to climate, to biodiversity, to health protection, and how to build a more sustainable and, and healthy future. So I would like to introduce now our high-level speakers of today. Um, we have um, at my left uh, Dr. Maria Akefeld. She works at H&M. I think it's not needed to explain who they are. Um, she's a chemical regulatory and strategy lead. Um, she has a PhD in textile materials engineering. And Maria works on present and upcoming chemical legislation globally while securing that H&M Group's um, chemical agenda remains ambitious and proactive. So welcome, Thank Maria. Um, Mary, um, and Sophie Bakar, uh, she's executive director of Chemsec, one of the most important uh, NGOs in fighting chemical pollution. 
Um, Chemsex involves uh, lawmakers, consumer companies, and institutional investors in the fight to turn things around. And Sophie is a chemist with over 20 years' experience in the field. And before joining Chemsex, she also worked for consumer organizations. Thank you for coming, and Sophie. And last but not least, we have Christina Ruden. Uh, she's professor at, in regulatory toxicology and ecotoxicology at the Department of Environmental Science in Stockholm uh, University. Her research uh, focuses on analyzing and evaluating the foundations or, and workings at EU um, chemicals legislation, in particular, how science is used for regulatory decision making, which is super interesting. And she has also served as an expert, not only for the Swedish government, but also for the European Commission and European Parliament. Thank you for coming, Christina. So let's start the, the discussion, perhaps. Um, I would like to, um, to kick off the discussion uh, by asking the panelists, Okay, how did we end it up in this uncontrolled situation? Uh, what are the, the main gaps and limitations on the regulatory framework? Um, anybody wants to start? Perhaps uh, you, Christina? I, I think you don't need it. Let's see if it works. That's, perhaps if you can move it a bit. Let's see. So perhaps, should I stop? Yeah, go want, ahead. Uh, so I, I just figured I, I might take this opportunity to also explain what H&M Group, um, you know, our, our perspective on chemicals management, because that may not be clear to everyone, even if they know about H&M Group. Uh, so we have, um, F for us, we, we started our sustainability work basically on chemicals in 1995. That's where, you know, it all came from. Um, and of course, uh, legally speaking, we are a downstream user of chemicals. So we don't use the majority of chemicals ourselves, but rather it's our supply chain that uses it, uses it to help us make products, of course. Um, and as such, what we experience is as the main loophole is information. There is not enough information about chemical products uh, that are you know, easily conveyed throughout the supply chain. Um, and this, this leads to, yeah, very, it, it becomes very, very difficult for us as a downstream users to really uh, become as pro proactive as we want to, do, to be. Uh, so when we wanted to, when we faced out PFAS ten years ago, for example, we had to really, um, we had to really struggle to get all the information we needed about which subs which products did uh, um, did contain PFAS, and also how to find alternatives that were not containing PFAS. So it's extremely difficult to do it. So information is definitely my my top. No. Mm. No. <laughs> no. Should I scream? No. Uh, no. Oh. Sorry, yes. it is working. Yes. <laughs> okay, good, thanks. <laughs> no, what I want to say is one more thing is that I think the problem is that so far we are mainly regulated one by one chemicals. The authority have to prove the damage of one chemical and then regulate it or ban it. And first now we start to regulate in groups. So I think that has really contributed to the problem we have with all the chemicals. Yeah. Um, well, to me, the foundations of a good chemicals control is that we have information about the chemicals that we use. So we need to know if they are hazardous. We need to know about their toxicities, how they behave in the environment. And when we negotiated the new, it's not new anymore, but for instance, the REACH regulation that came into force like 2007, it was the most lobbied uh, legislative proposal in the history of the EU. And the uh, industry was most active in lobbying to downgrade and reduce and limit data requirements as far as they could. And I think that's a fundamental problem of the system. Because in this system, if we don't have information, we do not consider the hazard. 
So if we haven't, for instance, measure, measured a chemical in, say, mother's milk, we assume that the concentration is zero. And if we have not uh, tested a chemical for, say, if it can interfere with the children's uh, brain development, we assume that it doesn't do that. So no data equals no hazard in the system. And we know, of course, that that is not true. So this habit or this feature um, uh, makes uh, us systematically underestimate risk in the system. And I think that's still uh, a fundamental problem. And then I agree with uh, Charles saying, it's not like I argue that we should have full scientific proof before we do anything, but we need like fundamental uh, information about all chemicals to, to effectively manage the risks. Thanks. Uh, indeed, we were promised to have uh, the rule of uh, no data, no market, but it became no data, no problem. <laughs> uh, so perhaps uh, a more precautionary uh, action would be a, a, a way forward, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, and what has the EU done? What has the European Green Deal done? Uh, or is, what do you expect, uh, expect that it's going to do? to address the chemical pollution? Uh, well, I think, I, I think the chemical strategy for sustainability was off to a really, really good start. It showed such a great level of ambition, etc. Uh, but, you know, and, and of course we, we have seen CLP delivered uh, with the new hazard classes, which gives us a bit more information. Also as downstream users, because that is the tool for us to get the information as well. But we do, I mean, the, the biggest thing that I'm missing is reach, obviously. It's the horizontal chemical legislation for your, the European Union. Uh, and as such, it's extremely important to have to avoid unclarity and confusion uh, for us as downstream users uh, to really um, level the playing field for us uh, in the industry. So that is the biggest thing that I see. At one point, I think we all know what the climate crisis is, but what is actually the chemical pollution crisis? So I just want to say a few sentences to describe what that is. Because we are at a stage where the ecosystems are unstable due to amount of chemicals, due to amount of hazardous chemicals that are released to our environment. So it is unstable. Yes, for example, we are now in Sweden. The Swedish teenagers have the double amount of PFAS in their blood that is considered as a safe level in the European Union. Double amount. And PFAS is a problem causing problem with fertility, causing problem with cancer, obesity. So realize what that means for the future generations. Another example. In the past 40 years, we have had a reduction of the sperm amounts to 50%. So in 40 years, 50% reduction in the Western world due to different matters, but one of the important causes is cause of chemicals. So what does this mean in 20 years yeah. or 40 years time? So these are examples just to describe what we're talking about when we talk about the chemical crisis that are so linked to climate and so linked to biodiversity. So therefore, the Green Deal was supposed to tackle this. So it presented a chemical strategy. And I must say, it was really good. There are really good things in there. One in particular important part is to tackle and to really restrict the most harmful chemicals. So that was great, I must say. The problem is after that, the implementation, to transfer strategy into actions, into regulations. I can say we have two good things. The big PFAS restriction that is coming. I think that's a really good outcome. And also that we now can classify classes like endocrine disruptors and persistent chemicals. That's good. But apart from that, I'm sorry to say it, it's not happening very much. Yes, what do you think, Christina? Well, I, I certainly agree that I was also very happy when I saw the chemical strategy coming out and I was like surprised. It was uh, progressive. It had a really tight deadline. Uh, so I agree there's a lot of good things in there. And uh, of course, the new uh, 
hazard classification or categories. Uh, we also want to see them coupled with really good test requirements for because a hazard category is nothing without the test data to go in there. So that's super important. And we also see now a discussion about adding a mixture assessment factor to, to the REACH legislation. Um, the proposal, as we have seen it in the high-level roundtable, is um, is relatively weak, I think. It's a low assessment factor suggested and it seems to be associated with a number of possible exemptions. But I, th I still think it's a very important principle that we'd be added to the legislation, namely that the total pressure of chemicals is just too high. So a generic mixture assessment factor will contribute to bringing down that exposure pressure a little bit. Uh, and therefore I, I welcome that, of course, even if it seems insufficient to really deal with the risk currently. What do you think uh, still needs to be done under this uh, current uh, European uh, Green Deal and mandate? Uh, well. De definitely deliver on reach, uh, deliver ambitious reach revision. Um, and, and, but I also think that, well, um, I would also hope that there would be a way to, to help incentivize sa safer alternatives moving forward. Um, but let's see if that is possible to do. I can echo you. I mean, reach revision, yes, extremely important to push it forward within this mandate of the European Parliament. In addition of this PFAS restriction, I would like to mention that we need a broad restriction, tackling these in the worst chemicals, because that will also show the way for next restrictions coming up. Uh, yeah, that's sort of the two most important one, I would say. One of the key features of this chemical legislation in Europe is the responsibility, a lot of the responsibility to test and to do risk assessment and to ensure safe use is put on the chemical producers. So the whole system lies on an inherent conflict of interest. And this way of setting up the legislation has not been coupled with strong supervision powers of, of authorities or enforcement or penalty, penalties of non-compliance. So I think that combination is like unprecedented. I really try to find other areas of technology where we combine this, we put the responsibilities with the people making money from this, but we do not check what they're doing. And we, what we can see from our research is that this is problematic. Uh, we see also other examples, of course, from, from science that industry tampers with data. They withhold different uh, or important toxicity information from authorities, preventing authorities from doing robust risk assessment and thus uh, hampers the way we do risk management. So I'm really, really troubled about this conflict of interest and in that we have an industry that not, does not take this responsibility seriously. Uh, so either we need to step up uh, with legislation, supervision, enforcement and penalties, or we have to work much more with industry to take this responsibility seriously. Um, and maybe we need both. <laughs> Yes, the, the question may be how to make them accountable no? mm -hmm. and responsible. Yeah. Uh, because we see many uh, irresponsible uses of very toxic chemicals such as uh, PFAS in cosmetics or dental floss or, or frying pans where you literally eat them. So what, what would you do to, to avoid that? Why, why do we have to spend taxpayers' money on this broad PFAS uh, restriction or ban? Why do we have to do that when industry knew in the 1960s and 1970s that these chemicals have unacceptable properties? Why does, does not this industry voluntarily stop producing them right now? Why should we have to push this group restriction or group ban all the way through the with, with discussions and questions and exemptions. Why don't they take this responsibility? To me, that's outrageous. And I, I wonder why society <laughs> does not respond to this more. Absolutely. And uh, perhaps this is also linked with the polluter pace principle, no? that it's, it's not really tackled um, in the
in the chemical strategy, the revisions of uh, REACH, uh, CLP, or... Do but what happened to decency? It's not just about <laughs> penalties and laws and, and fines. It's also about the next generation and the children that have to drink this in their water. Absolutely. Crazy. Um, I wanted to, to uh, come back to you, Maria. Uh, it's quite interesting to hear that uh, you are asking for more ambitious legislation while we have uh, other players from other regions of the world uh, asking for the contrary. Uh, so what, what do you think? Do you think uh, wh why do you think the delay of the rich revision would um, undermine your business? Well, uh, again, I think it's about having, uh, having a good and clear common understanding of what is being expected of us. Um, and, and that really helps us as part of the industry. Uh, it, it really helps leveling the playing field again. But it also helps, I think it helps us to, um, to, to understand how we, what we can do and what we need to do to still be proactive, to still stay more ambitious than legislation as well. So that's why I think it's, it's super important for us to have it because um, for one thing, not everyone, not all companies are big enough or have the resources enough to move ahead of legislation. So they actually need legislation to come into force. Um, and, and that will help leveling the playing field. And then again, um, so, so I also think it's important to, when you do have the resources, to be able to look, uh, look beyond that and, and find a good and Such also, th there are some uh, political leaders that frame um, environmental protection and regulation as, as obstacles for competitiveness, innovation. Um, what do you believe? Uh, do you believe that sustainability and competitiveness are opposing factors or mutually exclusive? And how can the Green Deal help to foster that European competitive advantage? also means uh, more sustainable uh, businesses? Well, it's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, f for us uh, working with extremely consumer close articles, most of us, uh, most of them are being worn every day. It's uh, sustainability, uh, Environmental protection, customer safety, they are not opposed to, uh, to uh, competitive advantage. Obviously, they need to be the same. Uh, we cannot, or it is a big opportunity to, to use it as a competitive advantage too. Um, and again, for chemicals, it's really about uh, our core uh, statement is that it needs to be safe. You know, safety has to come first. We have to avoid the most harmful chemicals uh, and find a good way of, of uh, making sure they are substituted. Uh, I think there are ways that the Green Deal can help incentivize this. Um, and one point there that we have identified is the chemical transparency. So increasing information requirements or incentivizing that more information about chemical mixtures uh, um, yeah, will be shared in, in the supply chains. And that's something that we definitely think that uh, the EU can help do. We also think there is a, an opportunity to incentivize development of safer alternatives, but of course they have to be demonstrated safe. So not just you know, incentivizing the, the chemical industry to develop them, but also uh, help reward downstream users when we want to use them or help make sure that we actually get recognized when we use them as well. So, um, Christina, uh, you were mentioning like companies producing chemicals. They many of them knew the, the these uh, hazards of these chemicals a long time ago. Um, but also, academia is warning uh, from decades uh, about these hazards. Uh, yet, the regulatory action doesn't come uh, that effectively as we and urgently as we would have hoped for. Mm. Do you have any idea on how to make um, the science being heard uh, in time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a super interesting question. But some, 
that, like the regulatory authorities have by history, I think, worked very closely with industry and not so close with, with academia. So I think it has developed like a little bit different cultures, if you like, between regulatory authorities and academia. Uh, and within the academy, we are not incentivized to actually engage uh, in regulatory policy development. So I think that is one problem. It's a really competitive area to be in academia, and if you're not incentivized, you really don't make time to do it. So I think that's important, to, to teach young students about legislation, about how society works, about risk assessment and things like that, but also for regulatory agencies to engage more with science. And I think like the commission being a super important funder of research, they can also... Uh, put requirements on scientists, because we see one very basic problem is how scientists report their data. We have like a different culture for how we write up our papers. And the, the regulatory science, it, it goes with OECD guidelines, you should report exactly like this, very square and things like that. So just for the EU funders to say, look, hey, you need to do your reporting in a way that regulatory agencies can identify or, or be familiar with. We need to have all this information to be able to use the, the data into a regulatory de decision-making process. So there are definitely things to, there are gaps to bridge, so to speak, but also things that can be relatively easy, uh, I think, developed if, if the will is there. Digitalization, for instance, just to have a very good system for sus substance identification, putting tags on every uh, academic study that it, oh, this concerns this chemical, that could be uh, digitally flagged in the regulatory system and make these mm -hmm. meet, so to speak. But I think both, both scientists and regulators need to start dancing. Yes, <laughs> um, we are getting there, I hope. Um, changing a bit the uh, subject, um, I know that Chemsec has worked um, with uh, investors and we were extremely uh, interested in this uh, letter triggered by Chemsec uh, of several investors um, asking some producers to stop producing certain hazardous chemicals. So it would be great to hear more about that and also how do you think uh, the EU can actually promote or attract investors in the EU companies? What, what, what would be needed? What are the investors asking for? Yeah, we start to talk to investors and some of them have been interested in climate issues. And then we can see that the chemical industry is one of the largest uh, green ga greenhouse gas emissions coming from the chemical industry. And the investors started getting more and more interested in biodiversity. And then they were unified in kind of chemicals because they see chemicals in the middle of all these with the climate and the biodiversity. So we have talked more and more to investors, informing them about chemicals. And since we are scoring the chemical industry on how they are performing, what they are producing, how much hazardous chemicals, how much safer chemicals and scandals, they were interested in this scoring. Uh, so it started up that investors now wrote a letter to the largest chemical producers in the world, asking them for more transparency, asking them to stop producing persistent chemicals, asking them to show their safer alternatives. And these were investors having 8 trillion American dollars asset under management. And since then it's grown even bigger. Now we have, we have an initiative with more than 11 trillion dollars asset under management from one of the largest investors in the world that are interested in chemicals and the chemical industry to see what they are producing. Because they realize that you have to continue producing chemicals, but you would like to put your money into the ones that are producing the safer chemicals and not the ones producing endocrine disruptors and persistent chemicals. So this is a driver of what we can really see and we can saw where three aim cited change shareholder interest when they said that we are going to step out of the PFAS production. So the investors we talked to, they were really happy, they could really see something is happening already. So now we try to help them facilitate the dialogues with the largest producers of chemicals in the world to stop them producing persistent chemicals and increase the transparency. Thank you. I would like to remind you all, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to use Slido. 
I will give one last uh, question and then we can compile. I see that there are some questions already, that's good. Last question, um, looking beyond the European elections and the current European Green Deal mandate, what, what would be your top one, two priorities for the second Green Deal that we are hoping for? What, what is the most important thing that we need? Well, to me, we still need to restrict the most harmful substances. That's, we have to do that for our daily life to survive. In addition to that, we need higher transparency, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. also. And we also need to come to pr products that are non-toxic and possible to recycle them and to reuse them. So I think for that is extremely important, these three things to me. Um, and I, I would definitely agree. I, I echo all three of them. So first one is implementation of the reach revision. Uh, definitely restriction on the most harmful chemicals, information requirements. Uh, and again, I would, uh, I would like to see some kind of incentivization of development and use of safer alternatives. Kind of similar to ChemScore and Marketplace that, that you have developed in ChemSec, actually. So, but, but in a legal context uh, to make it more forceful. Yeah, apart from the things that I have already mentioned with the conflict of interest and improving the data situation, I think we we need to work further on the one substance, one assessment approach that has started with the chemical strategy so we get more overarching chemicals uh, regulation. Because now, as Anne-Sophie talked, we, we we deal with one chemical and indeed one chemical and one use at the time. But in, in reality, we are exposed to a multitude of different chemicals regulated by different laws and these never talk to each other. Uh, so we need a more like holistic, overarching system to really uh, tackle the, the entire chemical pressure that we, we are facing. Thank you. Uh, we take notes for our work on the proposal of the Green Deal 2.0. But please, let's hear what the There are the a lot of questions. There's a lot of interest. And uh, so to try and summarize some of the most sort of commented and liked questions. Uh, there's one question on... Um, like Silent Spring by Rachel Carson was published in 1962 and already described the harmful impacts of chemicals and feels like not much is happening and someone else is mentioning what you've also been talking about, about PFAS. So what are the barriers? Why isn't more happening? Why is it taking so much time? That's one. Uh, and then there's a question uh, on, like there's the linkages between fast, fashion and overconsumption and environmental <laughs> problems and also the use of chemicals and what are companies like, how can companies uh, like H&M uh, change the business models uh, to address this uh, and also link to that, uh, for example, in the supply chains uh, to uh, make sure that all the production in the whole supply chain is aligned with uh, European legislation on chemical chemicals. And a third one is how can we make chemicals more visible at a policy and consumer level to further address the urgency? Thank you. Um, so indeed, perhaps to start with the Silent Spring one, um, yes, 70 years ago, uh, Rachel Carson warned us about the hazards of chemicals and yet, we don't seem to have learned that many lessons. Uh, we are, in fact, now with this uh, forever pollution scandal, no? uh, this investigative uh, research that exposed um, 17,000 hotspots of uh, PFAS and presumed additional 21,000 uh, across the EU countries. Uh, all of them are polluted with and now in many countries we are told we shouldn't eat local veggies and eggs. Uh, what, ha what is going on? <laughs> Can I start? I think we must acknowledge that a lot has happened since 1962. So we got one of the first EU chemicals legislation in 1967, the start of the CLP, that required industry to 
to uh, inform the users of chemical if they knew that the chemical were toxic. So th that was the start. So re let's remember, this is kind of a new regulatory area. Um, so a lot has happened, but innovation is much faster than regulation. And I think we, it's like almost impossible to keep up uh, with legislation. It's just going too fast. Uh, and we, therefore, I, I always like to stress that we need a, a responsible industry. And Anne-Sophie says that's, that's naive. <laughs> but, but I think it's an, it's an unbalance between innovation being faster than regulation. Um, so I think that's one of the basic problems, <coughs> the responsibility yes, question. This is uh, also, um, there are certain uh, legislations that set <coughs> targets, um, for example, for pesticides, uh, use, uh, pro manufacture and hazardousness. It, is, it aims to, to, to set this target uh, to reduce by 50%, but in chemical legislation there is no target although the, 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 pro the projection is to keep growing and growing and growing. Uh, so how, how can we kind of stop this trend uh, of growing? It's not an easy question. <laughs> <I know>. Sorry. <laughs> no, actually, I think to add on that first, I think one of the problems is that you have a plant. It costs millions to build this plant to produce certain chemicals. And then you want to make money with it. Why on earth should you stop producing it? You're making money, you invested into it, you want to continue doing it. Yeah? So I think that's a basic, actually. It's very difficult then to shift. It's not like, okay, today we do something else. It will cost very much money if in most cases to change it. That is the reality for chemical industry. But how can we change it? I think actually we have to start talking about the cap on it. There are so many chemicals around us. We see the effects on it. So we have to start discussing how will we stop having so much chemicals around us. So there's no way around it. We have to find a circular system. And then the product from the beginning must be non-toxic. Otherwise, circular economy does not make any sense, actually. But, but I would also like to add on there, because I think it's, it, it's been kind of overlooked in this panel, I think. Uh, to, but, and it needs to be said that, that, of course, everything is chemicals, uh, and we do need chemicals for everything. But it is, just as you say, extremely important that we know which chemicals we use, and that we can um, understand their hazards, and also make sure we don't use the most hazardous one. I mean, that, that is really key for us. So trying to avoid the worst, and, uh, but, but let's not confuse that with chemicals overall. And I think that is often done, and I think that is also a main barrier here for, for why chemical legislation is not <laughs> moving as, as fast as we want, it, is that there is simply a big knowledge gap about chemicals and, you know, what is good and what is bad. Uh, and I think that really needs to be, yeah, need, needs to be spread more. And so a big difference, I mean, in the chemical producers to, to exactly. you as a company selling to consumers, such a long distance between there, so the liability is not high then, in compared to what you have to stand in front of your consumers. Oh, exactly. And it's also even further away from Christina, who actually has to reach the research and the data at hand, so it mm -hmm. becomes very... Yes, too many gaps in the <laughs> road. And what about uh, this uh, question about changing business models, uh, Maria? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I will only talk about, uh, you know, in the aspect of chemicals here today, seeing that's my specialty. Um, but uh, definitely, uh, I think it's important to, again, try to move more towards transparency in the chemical supply chain. Uh, and that is, of course, the... Uh, the, the the responsibility of every company placing articles on market, trying to find out as much as possible about which chemicals are being used. And this becomes even more important uh, in circular business models and circular, uh, especially when, when you want to make products more circular, it's extremely important that they are safe and that they, you know, the the substances you have in them today should also be they should also be not only legal in, in 10 years' time, but they should still be considered safe in 10 or 20 years' time. That is um, a baseline, I think. Yes, that would also allow more trust uh, from uh, consumers no? on, on the chemicals, the products they buy uh, are safe. 
Um, so we have a last question, perhaps the most difficult one, how to make this an uh, invisible uh, threat of chemical pollution more visible and how to mainstream uh, the issue also in the political agenda, uh, heading a bit the, the, the EU elections, how to make it a more attractive issue to policy makers. It's a very difficult one. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, speaking from, from industry and business, I guess that, that can be, it's usually a, a good way to incentivize is to talk about that it, that it matters to business as well, that it is an important point for us as businesses, that it needs to be in place for us to enable the circularity goals. It needs to be there to enable this climate target. So we really need to make sure that we have safe chemicals first. I think we have to show in more the facts for political decision makers to make them aware of what we're standing in front of and not to just think about, oh, everything is hazardous, I can't act, everything is a problem. You have to have also have solutions, you have to think it is possible, you need a positive vision for the future, actually for all the triple planetary crisis, we need a positive vision, where should we go? We go forward and I think that's very important to show the solutions, where should we go, how do we go there? And when? Yeah. From the science, we have asked for many, many years to uh, have a declaration of chemical content in uh, in everyday products, like in everything. Because if you want, if your consumer want to buy this table, you don't know what it has been treated with, or the computer, or whatever. Uh, so that would be one way to to increase the information of what chemicals we use, where do they come from, the emissions, and enable science, and also somehow informed choices, even though I don't want to put too much um, responsibility on consumer because it's really super complicated, but uh, for scientists it could be really helpful to know this. Yes, indeed, that uh, needs to strike the right balance no? between mm -hmm. having the information but also leaving the responsibility at source. Yes. So I guess we need to start wrapping up. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I would like just to ask you uh, one sentence uh, as concluding <laughs> remarks. Um, what is your take home message, your main priority? What is most important to you? <laughs> exactly, trying to find it here. <laughs> 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 Who wants to start? I can start. start. I think we are facing a triple planetary crisis. And we really need to understand that chemicals is part of it. So we need to talk more about chemicals and highlight that. I would just like to have add a positive note. I, th I think we stand uh, in, in front of a period that we really have the possibility for real change. I think uh, the the knowledge and the awareness has sort of trickled both up towards the politicians but also down in a way that has not been the case before. Uh, so of course we need to capitalize on, on this uh, new situation that I think it really is uh, when we, a lot of things need to be done but we should not all just be negative. I think we also have great opportunities ahead of us. Exactly. Uh, and uh, I was going to say that I think ambitious and well-balanced chemical legislations and targets connected to that uh, will, will really help and are really fundamental to help level the, the playing field of business actors. So that will also help promote the EU industry, um, seeing that is a priority. Great, thank you. Nice to end up with a positive note uh, by the speakers. Thanks so much. It was really interesting <laughs> discussion. I leave it to you now, Eline. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, we will now uh, soon, when I've given you the information I need to give you, uh, break for lunch. Uh, lunch will be served, vegetarian lunch, uh, outside where you had coffee. Uh, and do take the opportunity to, uh, you know, talk with people you haven't met before or that it's been a while since you met. Uh, and I hope that everyone that are joining us online will also get a decent break and regain some energy before the next session. Uh, for the next session, that starts at 1.30. Uh, so you should be back seated or in front of your computer by 1.30. And uh, 
there will be no breaks during the last session, so that will run then until 3.15, and then you'll get coffee, uh, coffee break after the final session. Uh, and just, so there's food, talk to each other, and if you need to grab some air, I think now the, big, the doors are open downstairs, they open so you do not risk <laughs> getting locked out if you leave. Uh, and also, we had, there's our friends from the European Parliament have an exhibition ongoing, I think on the ground floor, uh, that they also welcomed you to visit in case you, yeah, want to wander around in the house. So that's all, so we're back here by 1.30. Thank you. <laughs>